two, surrender on demand. Varian Fry leads the American Rescue Committee to save artists. I am very pleased to see you. Um, I, I recognize a lot of your faces under your masks as being loyal supporters of these programs, which I sincerely appreciate. You all might know that I am Isabella Rowan, the program coordinator here at the library and the project director for the entire exhibit and programs. Today's lecture is part of the programs that have been planned in conjunction with the exhibit, Americans in the Holocaust. Um, you also all probably already know that we're one of 50 that were selected out of 250 applicants to receive this award. I'm very proud of that. And the purpose of the exhibit is to examine the motives, pressures, and fears that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war, and genocide from 1933 to 1945. And the key word in that sentence is Americans, Americans' responses. Okay, so the purpose of this exhibit is to look at the Holocaust from the American perspective in terms of what was going on here and what did we know. As, and on that same note, it asks and explores four main questions, and I'm going to repeat them, and I'm going to repeat them every time because it's important that we think about this. Um, what did Americans know? And if you've been to previous programs up until now, you know that we did know. We did know. Um, did Americans help Jewish refugees? If you were here on, was it Saturday? You'll know that, yes, some Americans did help. Why did Americans go to war? And how did Americans respond to the Holocaust? So my hope is that the exhibit and today's, you know, today's lecture will help you think about these questions, both historically and where we are now, and what our responses are to things happening in the world today, now, right? So as you know, the exhibit is here on display in the library through November 17th. If you have not brought your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, your relatives, your co-workers, please come and see this exhibit. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I, I think about the fact, especially with like school groups and stuff, kids that, and families that can't afford to go to Washington, D.C. to experience something as informative as this, this is an opportunity to see it for free. So let everyone know that you know that they should come and see this. Um, you know there's more programs coming, so check them out online and see if there's anything more that you want to you know, sign up for. There's still space. I'd love to have you every single time we're here. I should have had a frequent flyer card for you. <laughs> <laughs> Funding and other support for our Americans in the Holocaust programs have been provided by Menon, Dr. Regine Bataille, who is one of our board members, Temple Sinai of Palm Beach County, the Women's National Book Association, South Florida Chapter, the Delray Beach Historical Society, and the School District of Palm Beach County. Um, it helps to have friends and partners in the world to help things like this happen. So, and I also want to thank all of you again for being here because you guys are the reasons why we do these programs. So today's presenter is Helene Yentis. She has over 30 years of experience as an art historian an expert on Jewish art from all periods. Her diverse background includes presentations on art history and curating exhibit, exhibitions in museums, galleries, and rare book libraries. She has an MA in art history and Judaic studies from the University of Chicago. Welcome, Helene. Thank yes. you. Thanks everybody for coming. I am so delighted and really honored to participate in this really significant event in our community. And I'm not complaining, but it's too bad that each one of you didn't encourage 10 other people to come, especially with what's going on in the world today. And I really want all of us to give a really huge round of applause to Isabella and the Library of the United States Holocaust Museum. For those of you who know me, I'm going to derivate a little bit from my usual dialogue and interactive style. I've tried to synthesize a lot of information from many, many different sources. And as one of our guests pointed out to me, I don't have all the sources and I don't have all the, 
the references, and so maybe you will help me out a little bit on some of that. So each refugee, the Varian Fry, and each rescuer has their own unique story to tell. And so in that little short biography that I gave you, most of those are by survivors or immediate relatives, and so that's that story. So each one faced the daily fear of arrest, deportation, and death. Staying in Europe was kind of a death sentence, and people were not even able to earn a living. However, many felt leaving Paris was another kind of death sentence, and they often waited until the very, very last minute to get assistance and help and to leave. This was particularly true of the artist. Thus, they had great difficulty even accepting the notion of the American dream. So the format of the program is going to be, we will share some historical information about Barry and Fry, the Vichy government, and the work of the American Rescue Committee. Next, we will examine some great artwork by the giants of, in 20th century art. And finally, we will sum up the two sides of the same coin, the refugees and the rescuers. With some caveats, we will begin. I am not a lawyer, and I am not an expert on the Holocaust. My job as an artist historian is to guide people to look, to learn, and to learn to look at art in a new and different way, to see how great artists can be predictors of future events and also recorders of past events. So, some of you know a little bit about Mary and Fry. So, this is um, a slide which is a tailor for a movie. And I just want you to look at this while I'm reading some of this introduction to you. On August the 4th, 1940, Mary and Fry, an American journalist and editor, left LaGuardia Airport in New York. As the representative of the newly formed Emergency Rescue Committee, he was on his way to German-occupied France to lead a daring rescue operation. His conventional methods and absolute determination to save refugees enabled him to become the most successful person leading this type of effort. He settled in Marseille with a list of names of 200 people who were eligible for United States visas. These were artists, musicians, journalists, jurists, Nobel Prize winners, all kinds of intellectuals, and they were not only from France, they were from all over Europe, who found their, themselves trapped by the German occupation. Fry had $3,000 strapped to his leg, to begin this huge effort. Over the next 13 months, Fry and a small team of Americans and French helped 1,500 to 2,000 refugees escape. They used French troops ships to North Africa. The refugees were disguised as demobilized or wounded soldiers. Others were smuggled to ports in North America and South America, and others literally walked into Spain. They also gave aid and assistance to perhaps as many as 4,000 other people. Fry's main office was at the Hotel Splendide, where he and his staff did preliminary interviews with 60 to 70 people per day. His offices were everywhere and nowhere, so to speak. People met in cafes, the Sorbonne, artist studios, newspaper offices, and so forth and so forth. They had their own networking group just like we have right now. 
The refugees use their skills and their connections to become rescuers themselves. The artists forged documents. Others acted like bon vivants, as you kind of see Vary and Fry depicted in this image. Um, they were always calling attention to themselves in extremes much more than artsy types, I hate the stereotype, might normally do, and they used this as a way to distract the Nazi guards. The most wanted, the highest profile people, and the most desperate were hidden away in what came to be known as the Villa Airbell. It was both a safe haven for artists and a safe haven for what Hitler called degenerate art. Within a year, the collaborist Vichy government learned of Fry's effort. So in 1941, he was expelled for helping Jews and anti-Nazis. In 1942, the emergency rescue committee's office was raided and closed. And back in New York, Fry loudly, loudly but in the end, futilely tried to alert the world to what would commonly become known as the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And this picture that we're looking at is from an article in, 1912, in 2012 by Dara Horn, the writer, and she, this was in the New Republic. And she's talking about Barry and Fry. So notice the rose on his lapel, everybody's looking at him and people are just kind of walking by and not paying attention. And in the New Republic in 1942, Varian Fry wrote, there are things so horrible that decent men and women find them impossible to believe. And this is an actual photo and it is the publicity photo um, that was used for um, this exhibit. And another one of his really important quotes is, every life has dignity and is worth saving. So these are some of the people that worked with Varian Fry. The man in the upper left-hand corner is a, mo a man named Judas Rosenberg. And he was the last surviving member of Fry's inner circle. He was a young kid. He was kicked out of high school. And he was very, very Aryan looking, but he was Jewish. Some of these people were Jewish, and some of them were not. And he was a runner and a gopher, and he did all kinds of jobs in Barry and Fry's office. And he ended up as a college professor at Bard College. And you can see his video if you just Google him online. And um, the woman on the bottom left, also with the big rose on, is Mary Jane Gold. She was born in Chicago in 1909 and she died in the French Riviera in 1997. She was a writer and an heiress and a socialite who traveled back and forth to Europe. She got her friends to support Varian Fry's effort, and most importantly, she subsidized most of his operation, and she got her friends to donate and to support her as well. And the picture in the middle on the bottom is a picture of her in 1940 with the book that she wrote in 1980 called Crosswords to Marseille. And the woman on the top right and the bottom right is Miriam Davenport Ebel. And she was born in Boston in 1915, and she died in 1999 in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. She was, Ameri she was an American art student at the Sorbonne in 19, 
37, and she was the connection to most of the artists. She went to cafes, studios, she knew art dealers, and she was the one who did most of the interviews, and she was the one who determined who needed the help the most, and she became a lifelong friend of Mary Jane Gold, and together they purchased the Villa Air Bell, and in 1941 she became a member of the American Council of Learned Societies and the Committee for the Protection of Cultural Treasures. Okay, and probably the most influential Varian Fry operated with between 8 and 15 full-time staff members and they were all volunteers and they all came with no skills, very particular skills or some particular interest. So in this slide on the upper left we have a picture of Hiram Bingham the fourth he was born in 1903 and he died in 1988. He was from Connecticut and he was the American diplomat in Nice. And he moved to Marseille and he was the highest representative of the American government. So he knew the ins and outs of visas and so he was particularly important in this operation. He circumvented state protocols at every place that he possibly could. He arranged entry visas, often false ones, and Nancy passports, which were pe passports to people who were stateless. He was humane and compassionate, and he was very cooperative to Fry's cause. He hid Leon Fruchtwanger in his house, and his father was the governess, uh, governor of Connecticut, and his mother was an heiress to Tiffany's. So you can see he was, excuse this expression, pretty waspy, if you will. He was, but he was a great help to Varian Fry. And his last State Department assignment was in Argentina where he tracked down Nazi war criminals. And on the right, we have another really important um, helper of Varian Fry's and part of his staff who was Charlie Fawcett, and he was born in 1915 in Virginia, and he died in 1908, still in Virginia. And he was, the Lon he was a London rescuer, he was a freedom fighter, he was an actor, he was a musician, he was an expatriarch and an adventurer with an old Virginia family. He did all kinds of odd jobs, and he was really, kind of funny in the way that he did his work. He was a doorman at a relief center which gave him access to refugees and to people seeking asylum. He wore an official ambulance corps uniform. He kept order while steering def desperate refugees to interviews. He delivered messages. He found hiding places. He made deals with gangsters in Marseille, and he actually led the rescuees or the refugees to freedom in the mountains of Spain. And the last kind of funny thing that he did is he had six bigamous and bogus wives to help get out of the German, get women out of the German camps. And the last picture there is Daniel Benedite, who was a left socialist Protestant who was Fry's key aide. 
and I don't have pictures of three other people or four that are really important. Jean, a man, Gamaling, who was a liberal Catholic, who was early in leading the French resistance movement, and Marcio Verziano, who organized and operated the escape routes. He lived with Fry and he traveled with him. And last, Hans and Lisa Fritkow, they stayed at the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains and they led the people into Spain. Okay, so I gave you a handout. Do we have any lawyers in the room? Okay, um, so the top part of that has all of, I, your handout has all of um, the whole place that this topic comes from. So Article 19 of the Franco-German Armistice, which was signed in June of 1940, required the French state, French state, to turn over to the German authorities any German national on French territory, who would then frequently face deportation to a concentration. And so this is known as the Surrender on Demand Clause. And so there's a couple of things wrong with this statement. So just so you get an idea, this is a map of where the Germans were. This is the occupied section of Germany, and they had this blockade all around the northern part of Germany. However, this is the free zone, and Marseille, which is where we're talking about today, and this is the mountains. This is the Mediterranean Sea, how we got people out by sea and over the mountains. And so even though the Vichy government was running France, it was not really the French government, and this was not controlled by the Germans. So the French didn't have to turn over anybody. And when there was a legal case, then this would be the defense that they would use, and they didn't put up too much of an argument about it. So one of the first people to be, or not one of the first people, probably the most well-known and probably the most important person to be brought into the United States was Mark Chagall. And this is a self-portrait of Mark Chagall from 1925. And what is the first thing that you notice about how he portrays himself in this picture? And I invite you to participate a little bit now and then we'll kind of go back and forth. There's a lot of details about this. It looks a little feminine to me. It looks feminine. Does it look sort of like outrageous? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And there's one really, really important detail that I want you to look at. Seven Who said that? I did. Okay. He has seven fingers. And I just want to zero in. So the whole thing looks eccentric, right? Pretty eccentric, yeah. pretty great. What do seven fingers mean? Seven fingers on one hand. What does that little detail tell you about him or what he does or where he is in the world? He's different. He's different. What else? The number seven stands for something. Maybe what does the number seven stand for? What does the number seven stand for? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, probably. Days of the week. Days of the week. What a, What else? Deadly sins. 
Seven is a very mystical number for almost all cultures. It's the creation of the world, it's the days of the week. Um, for Jewish people, how many matriarchs and patriarchs are there? Seven. Three patriarchs and four matriarchs. Oh my gosh, I'm in really deep trouble here now with my next slide. Okay. Um, what about, one last thing on this one. What about his, um, the color of his skin? Vibrant. Vibrant. What else? Not natural. What's that word that we use for something not natural? I had a car once that was this color, like alien green. Okay. So anyway, Marc Chagall and his wife were refugees, the most famous ones that Barry and Fry got out. And Marc Chagall in his life was very different than some of the other refugees that we'll talk about. He's one of the few people who had one wife, which he adored forever, and some of these men had multiple wives and girlfriends and just really what I'm only gonna call eccentric and erratic behavior. Okay, so since you didn't know my answer about the matriarchs and the patriarchs, I'm probably in a bit of a bind here. This is a second Marc Chagall uh, painting, and the reason that I'm showing you this, it's called Abraham and the Three Angels, and I have multiple reasons for showing it to you. But the first and primary one is that this is the Torah portion we read last week. And it says, God promises Abraham that the Jewish people are going to be his descendants, and they're going to be like the stars in the heavens and the sands of the earth. And he's a very old man. And for those of you who know a little Torah, you know that he has another son with Hagar, and his name is Ishmael, and we're not getting into that today, but I wanted to stick with this notion. And so when Abraham is 86 years old, he and Isaac Ishmael, who is 13 years old, are circumcised, and when they are recovering from all the men are recovering from being circumcised. God sends three angels to Abraham, and he says that Sarah's going to have a child. So Sarah's 90 years old, Abraham is 100 years old, and what is Sarah's response? She laughs. Okay. Um, Maybe people who are art conscious know a lot about Chagall. He was also a terrific Jewish scholar, and a lot of his artwork and the little minute details that we're not going to look at a lot today, but a lot of the little minute details are rabbinic commentary about whatever he's illustrating. And very often he illustrates the same thing over and over again. And when we're talking about, this is still Mark Chagall we're looking at. Okay, and um, this is the violinist. And what is a violinist? What does it mean when you know how to play the violin? When you were a kid, didn't your parents say to you, I want you to have a little culture, let's play the piano, let's play the violin, play a musical instrument? Yeah, yeah. Violins have always been the symbol of the smartest people in the world. They're, 
they're musicians, and they're also, also mathematicians. And the place that we very often think about a violin player is Fiddler on the Roof, that how precarious life is. And so this is kind of a merger of both of those concepts. Um, and just, again, another one of his very famous paintings. And I alluded to this a minute ago. Um, this is The Lovers, and it was painted in 1913 or 1914. And he, did, he was married twice, but he was a widower, and he was a widower for a long time, and then he remarried. So what do you notice about this? Well, I guess I'll ask this more specifically. What does that black background kind of symbolize for you? Does that look like a happy place? No. Looks kind of ominous, right? Mm -hmm. So again, this is done in 1913. So now you're looking at the First World War, and he's seeing the darkness that probably is going to evolve, even though the key figures are kind of strange. The man kind of looks like Phantom of the Opera, and the woman kind of looks angelic, based both on the color of her clothing and the shape that's behind her. And probably both of those things are true. He certainly sees his wife as pretty angelic. It's like an angel wing. Well, like an she's holding her up. She's holding a cap. Mm. It's an angel wing, isn't it? It looks like it. It looks like it. So. It looks like the angel's behind her holding her up. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. How many people think it looks like an angel holding her up? Or how many. Okay. It looks like an angel. She we, looks, looks like, like an angel. angel. Or, or your other alternative is. She's portrayed as the angel. Third choice, always give people three choices. Your third choice is, it's not any of those things, it's just an amorphous shape. Okay, and now we're gonna look at another artist. Okay, um, this is a man named Jack Lipschitz. And the name of this is Sacrifice, okay? And you're looking at a front view and a back view of the same piece of sculpture that's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Okay, so who or what is being sacrificed here? Chicken. Looks like a chicken. Is this, is this okay. Is it looks. Like, let's look at this again. The binding of Isaac. The binding of Isaac. The binding of Isaac. Thank you. Okay, and this was done after the the war. So who is being sacrificed? The Jewish people. The Jewish people. And this reference back to the binding of Isaac is at the end of the, almost the end of the story, God asks Moses, Abraham, in one of his trials to sacrifice Isaac. But what happens in the end? It's the angel, as he stops him from doing it because he's willing to he's sacrifice his favorite to, to God. And he right. says, that's good. The angel stops him, and the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, us, were that sacrifice. 
And so this is a reference both to the biblical narrative and this idea of the Jewish people surviving. And going back to your idea that you said it looks like a chicken, <laughs> I know that was tongue in cheek. <laughs> okay. Um, but from the angle that you're looking at on that side, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm. But what is replaced for Isaac is a ram, or if you will, a scapegoat. Okay, and now we have a different thing. This is still by Lipschitz. It's called The Guitar Player, and it's this early Cubist style of art. And even though music is a symbol of intelligence and culture, which we already talked about, not the guitar, a guitar still sort of accomplishes the same thing. It's a stringed instrument, it sort of does the same. Okay, and then this one is also by Jock Lipschitz, again, after the war, and this is just called The Figure, and it's the beginning of primitivism in art and of movement called Dadaism. And just to change it up a little bit, this is the only person I put in here who's not an artist, so you'll have to bear with me. The reason that I put her in here is, first of all, does anybody recognize who she is? Oh, shame on us. Jane She's not an artist, you say? She's not an artist. It's Hannah Arendt. Oh, and the reason that I'm mentioning her at two points here, the portrait on your left is an early version of her, and the portrait of the right, which is the one I thought you would recognize, is a more mature version of her. And she is one of the most important political thinkers of the 20th century. And her works examine revolutions and total, totalitarian systems. And she was a spokesman about the Eichmann trial. And the aim of totalitarian education has never been to instill conviction, but to destroy the capacity to form any. And she also said the following, the trouble with Eichmann is that so many were like him and that the many were neither perverted or sadistic. They were, and they still are, terribly and terrifyingly normal. The normality was much more terrifying than all the atrocities. Okay, now we're going to move back to the artist. And this is a portrait of Jean Arp. And it was him in his studio in 1958. And you can see him sitting there in the middle. He was a sculptor, a painter, and a poet. He was born in Strasbourg, France in 1866, and he died in Switzerland in 1966. And he's known primarily as Jean Arp in French, and he's also known by Hans Arp um, in German. So he was the founder of the Dada movement. Um, it was a protest against everything, and he was one of the founders. And Dada actually means rocking horse or hobby horse in French. And he has used these. Um, 
biomorphic forms to illustrate his artwork. He had lots and lots of followers. He was kind of the voice of the Dadaist movement. And Max Ernest and Marcel Duchamp and his wife, who we will talk about in just a minute, were followers of his in different ways. And, oops, and this is his piece of statuary called um, Ptolemy. And Ptolemy was a Roman astronomer and mathematician. He was born in Egypt in 100 of the Common Era, and he died in 170. And does anybody remember from physics why he was so important? Okay, he believed and he taught that the Earth, not the Sun, was the center of the universe. Okay, so he was an astronomer and a mathematician, and our was really a mathematician, and he wasn't an astronomer, but he was a mathematician, and he was fascinated with mathematics, and fascinated with all kinds of things. Okay, and these are just some of his very famous Dada collages. They're kind of satirical, satirical and nonsensical, but kind of fun and pleasing, especially the two on the top and the bottom, the second ones from the left, the man with the mustache. Um, he's taken real objects and kind of reduced them to these biomorphic forms. I'm just curious, how did it happen that Mr. Barry and Fry started out with his intention of saving Jews. But it sort of wound up that he saved Jews that were artists. I mean, he didn't start out intentionally going to German occupied France to save the artists. Okay, let's back up for a minute. Varian Fry was an American correspondent before the war started. And he went to Germany in 1935 and he saw Jews, people, people being beaten up in the street. And then he was there right after Kristallnacht, and he thought this was so horrific. And then he came back to the United States, and as most of you well know, most people didn't pay any attention to him. They didn't want to do anything to rescue Jews. And Varian Fry, got a group of people in America to form the Emergency Rescue Committee. And the people that were on that original list of 200 people were all kinds of intellectuals, not just artists. And just to, I'm an art historian. I, this is my caveat at the beginning. I'm not a Holocaust scholar although I know a fair amount about the Holocaust. I'm an art historian. And so on the list that I gave you on the handout might be a fun thing for you to do is to just see how many of those people you actually knew or recognized their name. And another thing that I would like you to do with that is if anybody has a name or knows anything about that person or is distantly related or distantly connected in some way, you can be in touch either with the Holocaust Museum or the Varian Fry Institute. And it's varianfry.org is his institute. And people are constantly seeking these records. So we started with all kinds of people. And since my expertise is about art, right, that's why I went to artists. Okay, so this is Gene Arp, and this is another one of his pieces. It's just kind of fun 
It's called All Art is But a Dream and Nature, Day of the Artist 2011. Don't ask me what any of that stuff means because I have no idea. Um, and then something that, and someone I had never heard of before, is Sophie Tauber, who was his wife, and she, de she deconstructed all the barriers between arts and crafts. She did these magnificent puppets. You see photographs of her. I've tried to include either a self-portrait or a portrait that somebody else did so that you so that these become a little bit more real people to you. And these marionettes are just absolutely phenomenal. And she is also multi-talented. And R also stayed married to her for his entire life. OK, this is another one of her pieces, which is sort of a transitional piece which is kind of fun. It's called the cafe. Okay, and it's kind of fun. And it's kind of a description of cafe society, but it's also what I was trying to describe to you earlier about people hooking up in cafes, meeting in the street, accidentally on purpose, meeting, acting normal, and in the meantime, they're being interviewed to be rescued by Barry and Fry. And then she was, you can see, really multi-talented. She was one of the first people to do real textile designs, and she went to other cultures, to Mexico and to Africa, and these are some of her textile designs, and you can see some of these are part of the influences on the primitive movement in America. Um, and then we come to a really interesting fellow, Max Ernst, and Okay, and so this is a picture of Max Ernst, obviously later in his life. Um, and these pictures were taken probably somewhere in the early 50s. And here he is with some of his sculptures. And does anyone know who one of his wives was? Who was one of his wives? Another artist, I think. Give us a hint. An actress, an artist, Do you know who she was? Oh gosh. Oh gosh. It's Peggy Guggenheim. Did you say that? I'm sorry, with these masks and everything. I hope you can hear me. Okay. So he was married to Peggy Guggenheim for a while. She's a collector and, you know, she was saving all this degenerate art and then she began to sell it and sell it to museums and all kinds of things. And she has a gallery in Venice and she has a gallery in Jerusalem. Um, so anyway, a very influential, very interesting piece. Yeah. Okay. And now we're moving into this sort of different um, thing. This is a piece by Max Ernst, and it's really interesting. It's be the beginning of surrealism, and he does many examples of this with 
just slight modifications which change the whole thing and he keeps adding and removing different um, elements of the pictures and you'll see some of this and these are really disturbing because they come from his known world and all of the artists and the intellectuals and the people that came to Varian Fry came from some kind of married piece of information. They all knew about the Russian Revolution, not all. Some of them knew something about everything, but some of them knew just about one thing. They knew about the Russian Revolution. They knew about Franco. They knew about um, Freud. They knew about all kinds of things. And so this notion of prediction and then recording by the artist is what I'm trying to transmit to you. So on this particular one, let me just kind of read the description to you. The central rotund shape is derived from a photo of a Sudanese corn bin. But what does it kind of look like to you? An elephant. Kind of? Or a still building stove. A furnace. A fur oh, that was a good one. A furnace, an elephant. What else? There's no right or wrong answers here because everybody sees. One of them looks like a longhorn. It looks like, two, like, a, like the cowboy things with the long horns, with the two horns coming out of it. The bull? The bull. The yeah. bull face nose? A helmet. It looks like a pig. Okay. All right. So. Does this look like a friendly little elephant no. that you want to see no. in the room? No. It looks kind of like a sinister monster, right? Okay. And he also uses really weird combinations. So you see this giant elephant with the two man's feet, with the two feet of the man. See that? No. Okay. And then. Do you see the figure in the lower right hand corner? Yeah, the naked happens to have a head. Oh, Headless, female. And what is she doing? She's trying to stand up, you know, saying, stop, stop to this elephant monster. And again, his knowledge about Freud and. Um, And again, these are sort of cubistic sculptures, just to give you an idea of what his work looks like. And now I want to... Was he trouble? <laughs> he was trouble. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. Okay. I don't know how to put this. I don't mean to be critical of art, but some people have trouble really looking at horrible things. So if you do, close your eyes while we talk about the next slide. Um, okay, this really horrible to me, picture um, is called Angel of Hearth and Home. It was done in 1937, and in 1938 is was retitled The Triumph of Surrealism, and it's in a private collection. Why anybody would want to have that is kind of beyond my wildest ideas. But whatever. So his and most of the surrealists' um, idea was to shock and to confuse and really outrage people. So looking at this, 
we have this gargantuan, polymorphous horror who's kind of thundering along like a tornado, if you will, along this empty landscape. He's flailing his hands and he's got these vicious spikes on his hands and he sort of has the head of like some grotesque, horrible, bird-like thing that looks like he's kind of howling with grief. His clothes and his body are pretty tattered. And then there's this green thing on the left-hand side that has these horrible fang-like things which have the same, no, those are eight fingers, seven. Seven, cool. seven, the same thing that Mark Chagall used. Um, and the angel's eyes are closed to this mindless rage. I'm just reading a description from Art Magazine. Um, and so on. And we are left to imagine that over his piercing screams, it can hear nothing, not even the cries of those that it's about to crush. Um, you can open your eyes now. Okay, <laughs> this is a student of Andre, Andre Brenton, who was the head of the Surrealist Movement, and his name is Victor Bronner, again, one of the refugees. And he really went to all kinds of extremes with his viewpoints. He studied medicine. He was the one that wrote really a lot about surrealism. He wrote three manifestos. He, meaning Andre Breton, were really manifestos in reaction to the war. And he combined his ideas with a sort of Marxist socialist ideology. And he wrote a book called Nadja, which describes a mysterious love affair with a mysterious woman. And it's based on a love affair that he had with Liana de Lort in 1927, and he had a huge, huge art collection of Picassos and Mirus and Margits, and his estate was auctioned off in 2002 to the Pompidou Center in France. And he lived in New York during the war. And this is 20 examples of his surrealist art. And I, I'm not really a great fan of surrealist art. I get really, I find it very disturbing. I find when I go to a museum, I can look at one or two pieces, and that's about all I can talk about. But these are 20 of his ideas and reactions to the war. The I one, the eye that sees and nobody listens, the children being locked up. Um, and then another, oh, um, and this is another example of the surrealist kind of almost cartoon-like thing and this is a representation of Hitler. And the reason that I put this in is not because she's such a well-known artist, but it's, she was a, survivor, a refugee and her name was Wilfrida Lamb. And this is called Manifesto 13 Marseille. And so this is the same thing. And then another 
really important person, very important artist, is Marcel Duchamp. And so here he is with a bronze self-portrait. Um, and he's fascinated with chess pieces and the whole strategy of playing games. And in a sense, some of these artists really felt like playing with the Nazis was kind of a game that they could play, kind of a strategy that they could use. And of course, we all know it didn't work. So this is kind of a transition to a lot of things. It's starting out kind of Dadaism with this head and surrealism with the head in the hand and then kind of cubism with the pieces from the chessboard and the very angular shape that's holding up this very thoughtful man. Okay, and then some of you may know this, and this is probably a better illustration of how he got from data, Dadaism to really more abstract expressionist kinds of things, and so you see this real figure here, you see the real figure here and here, and then sort of these chess pieces in the middle, and then one of his most famous pieces is called New Descending the Stairs, and this is obviously now very abstract and very cubistic, and I want to kind of go back a little bit here. Um, this is um, a piece called Mother and Child. It was done by Jack Lipschitz, who we talked about earlier. And this was done in 1945. And it's a Holocaust memorial. And it's right as you come in to the Israel Museum where the sculpture garden is. It's right there. You can see from the slide where it is. Okay, so now I want to ask you, now I want to ask you, I really want to look at this piece of art because to me it just tells so much about everything that we've talked about all through the day. So, we called Mother and Child. So, I hope everybody can see the child here hanging on the mother's neck. Do you all see that? Okay, so let's talk about the mother for a minute. She's, she's opened her arms and she's praying. And what does it mean that she has survived when she's in that realm? And, and she has no hands and half of one arm is missing. So she is obviously a victim of the Holocaust. Okay, and what about the fact that her breasts and her sexual parts are really overemphasized. Life. 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 Life goes on. There's hope. Life goes on. And so, and what about the child clinging desperately to her? You know, the child is pretty well clinging to her. 
And so in 1945, he was living in Israel. And he goes back and forth, he went back and forth from the United States to Israel. And just as a little aside, when I was in college, I wrote one of the first papers I ever wrote in college in an art history class about him. And I hadn't thought about him for many years, and then I did something else with him a while back. And I went online, which is how I get most of my images. And I picked out five images. And they were the exact same ones that I picked out when I was in college. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is really unbelievable to me. And when I do these things, I write down notes. And so I wrote down my notes. Then I went back to the college thing. And not only did I pick the same artwork, I had almost the same reactions, of course, additional ones. Okay. And then, so what? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is um, a phenomenal, phenomenal piece of artwork. And it is in the Art Institute in Chicago in a not very prominent place. And it's not a very big painting, but it is unbelievably powerful. And I used to go to the Art Institute a lot in Chicago, and I never, ever went there and didn't look at this painting. So first of all, I'm going to ask you, why does he pick a white crucifix to illustrate why does he even pick this as a subject? It's Mark Chagall. Okay, maybe it'll help if we kind of go around and look at some of the things that are here. Okay, do you see these letters over his head? Okay, I'm sure you can't read them. But in Latin, it's I-N-R-I, which he has kind of jumbled up in Hebrew and Aramaic. And the real saying is Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. But what Mark Chagall has done, which I told you about this very Jewish background that he has. The way he wrote it, or spelled it, is a double rabbinic acronym, which means, may his name and his memory be wiped out. So this is a double entendre here. Whose name is he wiping out? Is he wiping out Jesus's name, or is he wiping out Hitler's name? And you have all of this suffering. You have a history of suffering. You have the Nazis marching over here, the pogroms in Russia, uh, the people walking away from their homes, people in fires, again, the Russian pogroms. And it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of really deep psychological things. Okay, so in a just kind of an overriding sense because he uses Jesus on the cross, the work owns Jesus as a Jew. And it's a call to people to acknowledge that Jesus is a Jew. And, and just another little piece of information about this is Pope John the 23rd. This is his favorite piece of artwork anywhere in the Vatican, anywhere in the world. This is his favorite piece of artwork. And I don't remember. Just look it up. 
Just look it up. Say there, 1918. 1918. It's almost destruction of the Jews all the time. Right, and he certainly catches that. And he catches it, he catches it at the center of this painting. And he also, in this image, Jesus becomes the center of all the horrific suffering. And he is also in that suffering all the time. And finally, you know, when you see great pieces of art, you see different things at different times. And the first time I saw this painting, which is very small, it's, it's like a quarter of the size of what you're seeing up there. The thing that came to my mind when I first saw it was that this is a criticism of Catholicism. And they're seeing Jews as the other and the failure of the Catholic Church under Pius XII in 1939, from 1939 to 1958. Oops. Okay, so um, I want to kind of sum up and um, conclude. Um, so this is very bright, and on the upper right, you can see is the Hotel Splendide, which was the initial place of contact and it's, believe it or not, now part of a chain of luxury hotels. And on the bottom is Villa Air Bell, which was the place of hiding, which served as an art colony. And so, the artists and intellectuals who were able to get into the United States transformed the shape of American art and architecture forever. They were influential in putting New York on the international map. Their influence continues to permeate many colleges, universities, think tanks, and major cultural organizations. And the ultimate irony, I think, is how much they contributed to our society versus how resistant so many Americans, particularly our government, were to giving these people refuge. And so, again, I want to just go back to some of the things that all of these people had partially or in some way in common. They all traveled in these intellectual artistic circles, salons, cafes, studios. They were creative in multiple disciplines, writing, poetry, art, music, composition. They were creative and eccentric and ostentatious, both in their lifestyles and in their behavior. And I hope you've got a little sense of how that was reflected in their artwork. Some had communist connections. Some were from German, French, and Russian places. And how they all come together in Marseille or Paris and then Marseille. There were Viennese groups and Austrian groups who other people helped out. There were groups of Hungarians and Romanians, and many of these people went back and forth to Europe. They were writers, they were editors, they were publicists, 
They were leaders of art movements. They were critics. They were collectors. They had multiple names and pseudonyms. And unfortunately, which I didn't really talk about at all, many of them along the way committed suicide, like Primo Levi and Walter Benjamin. And they were all about 40 years old in 1940, some a little less, some a little more. Again, some couples, but mostly had um, multiple wives and multiple girlfriends. And so I would like to end this talk with words by Varian Fry. This is his book, Surrender on Demand. I would like to end this book like a Victorian novel by telling you that what happened to all of the characters, but I cannot do that, not because there are too many characters, but also because I don't know what happened to all of them. Mm -hmm. And so that was my request to you. If you know any of them, anything special about any of them, please share it with the Holocaust Museum and the Varian Fry Institute, which is varianfry.org. And I want to thank you for being a patient audience and I guess, I guess I can entertain some questions, but I always like to think that I'm the one that has, has the questions, not answers. What happened to Barry and Fry? Can you tell us? I'm sorry, what? What happened to Barry and Fry? He came back to the United States, and he became um, a, a teacher in a boys' prep school. He taught classics in a boys' prep school. And he died at a very young age. He died when he was 59, and he was 32 when these events took place. Yeah. Oh. This was a, obviously a very large operation involving all of the artists and the people working with Fry. But I'm not clear on as to what extent it was out in the open and to what extent it was undercover. And if it was undercover, which I assume it was, what the cover story was. What was he supposed to be doing there when he was carrying out the work of the Emergency Rescue Committee? Okay. It, it wasn't the American Rescue Committee then. It was the Emergency Rescue Committee. And it became the American Rescue Committee later on in the Korean War. Okay. You know, you had asked a question that I, I really don't have a good answer to. But from everything that I've read, it was a very small but very tight operation. And people came and went. And they literally met on street corners. And they met in all kinds of odd little context. You know, this um, woman, uh, I can't remember her name, Miriam Davenport was an art student. So she was at the Sorbonne. So remember when you were in college? And you used to go and sit and have coffee with people. Well, if she's an artist and she's in France, in, the, in Paris, when the height of the French art world or the art world in general was in France, she's in touch with this, these people. And again, the Vichy government well, the Germans came into France in 1940. So that's like halfway through the war, a little over halfway through the war. And they lived in Paris. And they thought they were invincible. You know, and then when Varian Fry persuaded the Americans to form this rescue committee, Eleanor Roosevelt was involved in it too, and some Thomas Mann was involved in it. So they know pe new people in Europe, and there was a list of 200 people who were somewhere in the immigration process and eligible to get an American visa. And so when those people came to be processed, 
they would say, oh, please help. Please help Mark Chagall. Please help this physicist. Please help this doctor. Please help, please help. And so this little undercover operation, if you will, kind of moved from a couple of locations. I don't, I, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a very cogent answer on that. But from everything that I read, and I read an awful lot, you get, you know that description of the elephant when you ask five people to describe an elephant? One describes the trunk, one describes the body, one describes the tail. This is kind of the way I felt, and I, I still kind of feel, and that's why I'm asking you the very specific that I, question that I'm asking. So, does anybody know when you first looked at the list of people, did you recognize the name of anybody on that list? And I took that list and then I separated them out to, um, I just took the artist right off the names from that list. But I know that there are others, and um, if you know of others, if you know anything, you know, about Barry and Fry, please share it. I don't know that, but I do know one other little important fact, and that is that um, um, Mr. Fry is one of only four or five Americans that have been honored at Yad Vashem. And he was the first a, one, and I'm righteous, sorry, I meant to mention that. Christian. Yeah. But I think there are just the, the couple that we saw the movie about, right. the, the Starks, Starks. Sure. Sure. and then Barry yeah. and Fry, and I think only one other American is on that walk of, walk of the, the, work, the, the righteous. The wall of the righteous. So he must have been very, very right. appreciated for right. his work. Absolutely he was, absolutely he was, and he was amazing. And you know, when people ask him, why did he do it? What do you think the answer was? I had to. I had to, it was the right thing to do. And I had a friend who was the director of the religious school in the synagogue that I belonged to in Chicago. And he also taught Holocaust studies at Spurtis College. And he actually did a study of people who helped people get out of Nazi Germany. And absolutely, almost to a person, he said, every single one of them said they did it because it was the right thing to do. And there's a man named Pierre Salvage who is a French movie producer who runs the Varian Fry Institute in Los Angeles now. And he lived in a town where there were not very many Jews. And they sheltered many, many Jews. And a foundation, I guess he used his money, and he formed the Shambon uh, foundation, and one of the things that they subsidize is the Barry and Fry Institute. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you again, Isabella, for inviting me. I hope you were satisfied. I hope you'll invite me back again, and it was great to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you.